summary of the benefits of mediation, I would certainly say time, um, because the timing is much quicker than it is going through the court process. Uh, the ease of it, because I can arrange mediation appointments convenient to all parties involved. So it could be a Saturday morning, it could be a lunchtime, it could be a sort of early evening, it could be early morning. Whereas, you know, court time, you're told what time to get there, and then often you have to wait around for, for a long time before your case is even called. And of course, expense uh, is, is another significant benefit. It doesn't feel like it initially, but, you know, uh, if mediation is successful, then you're splitting the fees rather having, than having sort of separate lawyers' costs, um, which can then escalate and, you know, there's a court process that, that can be very expensive. And I suppose fundamentally is remaining in a sort of relationship with the person, especially if it's children issues, because, you know, there's going to be a long time ahead of that couple where they have to make decisions together. And I think if they can start the process off by being involved with each other in terms of being able to have proper conversations about the, the, the children who matter to them both, then that's a good start in terms of the children's future. Everybody has to try mediation these days, so they've lost nothing uh, in some respects by coming to the first mediation session. Um, because it's now a requirement before you can issue, even issue an application, uh, you've ticked a box by, by coming. And the advantage of it is that, of course, until you try it, you don't know how it's going to work for you. But a lot of clients actually find it more beneficial than they ever thought they would. So they come along to the first mediation session almost under duress because they're told they've ha they they're told they happened to. And then they come along and they actually think, well, actually, that was more beneficial and we were able to talk around sort of all different issues in a way that I didn't think we ever would. And I think it, it, it's a conversation, really, as mediation. It's a conversation between your former partner or your former wife who has the care of your children. And it's really important to open up a dialogue with that person, not necessarily just for the mediation process, but, of course, for, for the long-term benefit of the children anyway. So if you can start to air some of the issues and to overcome those issues in what is really effectively supposed to be a safe environment, allowing you to talk about what you want to talk about without being fearful of it coming back to sort of be used against you in, in court proceedings and things, it then sometimes re-establishes trust and it's often trust that's been broken down when a relationship ends. So if you can start to build on that trust, then it sort of establishes a good foundation for where you can be in the future. So you can start to have that dialogue, you can start to have that relationship building uh, or mending for the sake of your children. Um, and that's something you don't ever get at court, because by the time you started the court process, it's accusations flying backwards and forwards. You never really get to sit down and talk with the person. Uh, and discuss what the real issues are or what the concerns are. You're asked very specific questions and it doesn't really give you that ability to, to talk to the other person as you would if you were still in a relationship with them. Um, I think to be a mediator, part of the training is to make sure that both parties to the mediation have, have their viewpoints put forward um, and that one person doesn't speak over the other or the other person just says yes, 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 just to get out of the room. Um, and you often get that feeling sometimes that's what some people are doing. I always have a meeting which deals with the do's and don'ts and one of the do's and don'ts is to, to, be, able to be able to put your side forward um, and it may not be an issue for one of the parties but if it's an issue for the other person, person it's an issue for mediation so it's very clear that um, whatever the issue is, however important it is for either one of them or how less important it is for the other, it's still an issue which needs to be discussed and, and considered at mediation because it's an issue for one of them. Um, I think I always try to say please make sure you do listen to the other person because otherwise we just talk around in circles um, and I will always interfere or rather intercede perhaps if there is one person talking too much and the other person's not saying very much at all. Um, and sometimes it's, it's sort of necessary to have one mediation, sort of bring it to an early end and then for the people, the, the parties to go away and think about it and then maybe have another mediation session once they're more confident in, in the process and, and more used to what's going to happen. I think sometimes the first mediation session is always a bit nerve-wracking because Often it's a case that you haven't seen your, your former partner or spouse for quite a lot, some time. It's the first time you'll be seeing them for since, you know, since the breakup. Um, and sometimes it just takes a bit of getting used to. Um, 
to understand you know how best to do it so sometimes the first mediation session you know it doesn't get us very far but the second mediation se session you know the, the couple are much more confident in themselves and more able to put their points of view forward it's it's a different hat from being um, a lawyer a family lawyer and it's it takes a while to get used to the different role actually clients find it quite difficult to to differentiate between you being a lawyer for them and, and actually being the mediator and a number of clients will say what do you think and, and can I just ask you this advice and it, it's you have to be very confident and tell them that you know uh, that's not what my role is and the role is to, to simply help them reach a decision rather than giving them actual advice. It's not about me giving advice, it's about me helping you to reach an agreement which is suitable for you both. People often come in and, and will say, well, what is the role of a mediator? Why do I need a mediator? Especially because I usually say, as well as a mediator, you should really have your own solicitor on board too, so that if you need advice at any time during the mediation session, you can actually then access that legal advice. Um, and they do often say, but why then do I need you as well as a lawyer? Um, and it's trying to get them to understand the concept that actually the discussion is between them and their spouse or partner, former partner, um, and it's for them to reach a decision and, and therefore for me to be able to be as impartial as I need to be, it's impossible for me to be able to give advice to either one of them. And that to maintain that role of impartiality, I really have to be very firm in not giving anything other than information. Um, and I always say it's always a good idea to go and see your solicitor or take advice from your solicitor because the one thing you don't want to happen from mediation is for somebody to say yes, yes, yes or agree to something and then walk out the door and go and see their solicitor and for the whole process to be undermined because that then sort of undermines the trust that the other person would have if that person has said yes, yes, yes in mediation but then immediately says no once they've spoken to their solicitor. So I always try to say it's really important to have another solicitor on, on board as well so that when you've come to the, the decision that perhaps an offer is the right offer to take, go and check it out before you commit to it. So it's, all, it's very okay to say in mediation, that sounds like a good offer, I'm not saying yes, I'm not saying no, but I need to take some advice, I'll come back next week and give you my answer as to whether or not we can proceed on that basis. And I think that's a better way of dealing with it than it is to make an instant decision and also then have the solicitors on board so that when they draft the consent order or whatever it is that they're drafting, they can then, they're already signed up to, to the sort of terms of the agreement which are, are going to be put before them to embody into a formal document. I have one particularly successful shuttle mediation where um, we had, I think it was two sessions which were in separate rooms. Um, we started contact up and running and it started to progress and then gradually the mediation moved so that they were both in the same room but it just needed that sort of breaking in period where they just needed not to be in the same room but then when they knew no bad things were going to happen they could then move into the same room and start to have the dialogue between them rather than me sort of passing on messages from one to the other. So even if somebody is very reluctant to be in the same room as their former partner or spouse, there are ways to overcome that and for mediation still to be used and still to be successful. Many people come in to see me and say at the outset, oh well there's no point because my other, uh, my former partner won't attend or my former wife won't attend. Um, and it's amazing actually that the other person then is willing to come to mediation and, and is willing to sit down and, and talk it through. So sometimes there's an immediate misconception that the other person simply won't come to something uh, or won't come and talk about the children or won't come and talk about finances. Um, so if you can overcome that, if you, I, I mean partly these days you have to attend mediation anyway. So again, you've lost nothing by, by coming and talking about mediation and finding out about it and then inviting the other person to, to, along, to come along to something similar and then with the hope that you will have a full-on mediation session. And I think, you know, many people do want to resolve issues and, and there's usually something which is stopping them from being able to talk to the other party. Um, I have one mediation case where, uh, where, where the chap had suffered a, a, a long-term illness. He, he was diagnosed with being quite poorly. Um, and the lady, all she wanted really, well, it, was, it was a mediation about sorting out the house more than it was anything else. Um, and there was a real stumbling block, they just couldn't move it forward. Um, 
And what it turned out to be was that all she wanted him to do was to say sorry and to acknowledge that although he was the one diagnosed with having, having the illness, it had a direct impact on the rest of the family as well. And her, her real stumbling block and her, her real, you know, the reason why she was so blinkered in being able to deal with the finances was because he, he at no point had acknowledged that they had suffered too. And when it came out in mediation that really she wanted him to say sorry, um, and he acknowledged that he hadn't really thought about it from the family's point of view, only from his own point of view, put his head in his hands and said, I'm so sorry. As soon as he uttered those words, we sorted out the finances. So, so often, the reason why somebody doesn't want to talk about the issues, there is something that's preventing them. And if you can get to the heart of that and if you can deal with that issue, then other things just fall into place. The best reasons for mediation are um, the timing of it. Uh, you can have mediation much quicker than you had can have court hearings. The flexibility of it, you can have the times arranged around you and the mediator. So it can be evenings, mornings, weekends, whatever suits you both, so you're not subject to a court timetable. The cost, obviously, because you split the cost of mediation as opposed to having to pay your own lawyer's fees of going to court and representing you. Um, and the maintenance of a relationship between you and your former spouse or partner, especially if there's children, it hopefully means that you can continue to have a relationship where you can have a dialogue about important aspects, certainly of a child's life, without having to keep going to court every five minutes.